So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you the parameters for the next um, session, which is the panel session on um, predator-free New Zealand. I'm going to ask all our panel members to come up here um, whilst I'm sort of giving the, the broad outline of what's going on. So what's going to happen in this session? We've only got 45 minutes, so it's a little bit shorter than some of the other panel sessions. Um, the panellists have in advance been emailed a question, which I'll read out to you in a moment. And what I'm going to do, I've given each one of them two minutes to outline their position on what they think on the question, which I'll give you in a second. And, um, and then basically what I'm going to do is once each of them have see, had their say, I'm going to open it up to the audience uh, for questions. And also I've probably got a couple of questions of my own. So on our panel here, I would like to introduce in no particular order, Jamie Steer from the University of Auckland. Just wave your hand so people know who you are. James Russell, also from the University of Auckland. Um, Nicola Tolke, DOCS Threatened Species Ambassador. Uh, Judy Gilbert from Windy Hill Sanctuary on Aotea, Great Barrier Island. Uh, Devon McLean, Project Janzoon and on the board of Predator Free 2050 Limited. And finally, Wayne Linklater from the University of Victoria here. Okay, so the question that's been posed to each of the panel is Predator Free New Zealand, it's a crazy and ambitious goal. And on a scale of 1 to 10, what's your level of enthusiasm for Predator Free 2050 and why? And on a scale of 1 to 10, how confident are you of New Zealand's chances of achieving that goal and why? And what I'm going to get each of our panellists to do is speak for a couple of minutes on that topic. And I'm just going to keep going through the panellists in order and then uh, we'll open it up to questions later. So, Devon, do you want to kick off? Okay, thank you. So, um, what's my uh, enthusiasm for this? About ten and a half. Um, and uh, the reason for that is that I finally see us getting focused on doing something here. And one of the things that's really concerned me in a lot of aspects of the conference is a lot of good stuff being talked about, but what are we going to do tomorrow and how much of a difference is that going to make? Um, we know what we're going to do tomorrow on this project and it's going to make a huge difference if we get it right. Um, and not just because we're going to bowl um, three of the critical uh, predators in, in the country with a huge impact on our biodiversity, but we're going to actually uh, engage the connection between conservation, the economy and, uh, and social resilience and create models there that have applications in other things that New Zealand as a society can do. So I'm hugely positive about this and, uh, and my expectation in terms of delivery uh, well, it might be a whisker short of 10, but not much. Short and sweet, thank you. Okay, over to you, Jamie. All right, thank you. Um, I'm sort of at the opposite spectrum to, to Devon here. I'd put my level of enthusiasm for Predator Free uh, at close to a zero, probably. Um, honestly, I, I don't want to see us diverting uh, resources into this sort of crazy stuff. Um, and that's because I, I just think it's actually the wrong approach uh, to, to protecting and sustaining our biodiversity. So uh, I've got a couple of points that I want to make on that. So the first one is that we don't need to kill rats, stoats and possums everywhere to save our biodiversity. That's, that's actually not necessary. We can protect our most cherished and vulnerable species uh, in much smaller areas than they once ranged. Uh, and that's something that we're very good at. Uh, will that enable us to keep all of our uh, species and ecosystems from the past? Uh, no, uh, for me, uh, of course it won't. Uh, we don't get to have everything from the past. So as most New Zealanders already recognise, we have to learn to find more middle grounds there. So second, the focus on eradicating just five mammal species sets up unrealistic expectations that will prove, uh, uh, that this will prove some sort of um, cure-all for uh, indigenous biodiversity decline. Uh, whereas for me, it, it really won't. Uh, these are just a few of a vast suite of tens of thousands of introduced species acting individually and cumulatively to change our ecosystems to say uh, nothing of other drivers of, of, uh, of change. Uh, and as, if, as we've seen with the arrival of rust myrtle in the last few days, new species will continue to migrate uh, to New Zealand too, whether assisted or otherwise. So we'll have to learn to live with most of these new uh, arrivals and the changes that they'll bring. So it's, it's really reconciliation then, not restoration, that should be our focus. Which leads me finally to number three. 
we're fixated on trying to get rid of problematic introductions and trying to put the environment back to the way it was when the real threats to life in New Zealand are not from uh, the exotic components of our biodiversity, whether predator or otherwise, they're really from our unsustainable land and resource uses. I think we increasingly spend our time policing and micromanaging wildlife when really we should be focusing on getting our own shit together first. Thank you. Over to Judy, thank you. How do you follow that? Um, I think for me I have to take it back to a really a small and quite selfishly focused micro level which is Aotea Great Barrier Island and one of the things that really excites me about this crazy and ambitious vision is that as you saw earlier on one of the maps it gives a chance for Aotea to possibly be one of those first cabs off the rank and it, and it may well be that within the context of this gentleman's argument that that's a fair kind of a sized island, 28,000 hectares with some really unique biota to, to have a shot at being, protect, at being protected um, as part and a, and a really important stepping stone toward this crazy and ambitious vision. And I was also really taken earlier today with that map about things that start really small. And I think Windy Hill started as six rat traps under my house in 1997. And this year it's 770 hectares. It's got 53 landowners. 80 kilometres of tracks, 5,000 stations, and we're working with good nature and we're working with censored traps. And so one of the things that I think is really important about this vision is it gives inspiration to ordinary people like me to actually get going on this stuff, whereas some of those issues that you've highlighted feel too big, feel too out of reach, whereas I think if we can... And, and obviously in the urban context, how interestingly excited are some of our, our small towns and cities about this idea. So I think in terms of human beings and our willingness and desire to be excited by projects, I'm giving it a 10. Thanks, Judy. Nicola? Two minutes will be a challenge, but that's okay. <laughs> um, how enthusiastic am I? Well, um, I'm sure most of you know that I'm generally about 100% enthusiastic about this idea, and after this morning, I'm currently sitting at about 150% enthusiastic, uh, having heard the science, the community input, the growing social enthusiasm and action uh, that's going towards this movement. Um, this is not some story that came about when a bunch of hippies were in the bush in 1970s. This is a story um, and an idea that began over 100 years ago, um, not the least of which was raised by Richard Henry, but um, our very first ranger who did his best to save Kākāpō and Kiwi, but also the Zoological Society of London, the Royal Society, who begged the government not to release the things we are desperately trying to get rid of now. Um, so for me, this is about two things. It's not about, it's not about predator-free as much as it's about fighting extinction, and predator-free will take us there. From my point of view as Threatened Species Ambassador, the challenge is real. We have 3,000 at risk and threatened species in New Zealand that we can't simply sit down and say it's too hard to, to do something about them. Um, so this movement does something important. It fights extinction, and we know that it does. We don't, I don't need to go through the evidence of what happens when you take predators away from our native wildlife, because we all know that. It also hinges on national identity. Our native wildlife is who we are, and that's sort of surprising because 87% of us now live in towns and we're all connected to the things that define us, the kiwi, the kakapo, the tuatara, the giant weta. 30 seconds. Fine. When we feel helpless, um, what, what happens is apathy. And after apathy happens, then we all sit down and watch The Bachelor. We're not that country. What Predator Free gives us is the opportunity to turn our apathy into action and give the ownership of this problem back to the community, people like Judy, um, and let us do something about some, one of the big problems in the world that we can actually turn around. Thank you. That's fantastic. Right, James. Hi, everyone. My, look, my enthusiasm is absolutely at 10, both because... Uh, uh, really an enthusiasm born of necessity because this is something we, we have to do. I've 
was raised in suburban Auckland where we had uh, my mother raised kakariki and uh, we would have dozens of these chicks raised a year and um, but they I'd have to travel uh, hundreds of kilometers or to remote offshore islands to see these kakariki purely because of the threat of uh, introduced predators and I've been on islands where I've had to, to euthanize native endangered birds because of um, uh, introduced predators killing them uh, in front of my eyes and leaving them there to die so I think that's just a, a huge environmental injustice. So uh, my enthusiasm is absolutely 10 for this um, because of other reasons such as currently our native species are only absolutely safe in less than a quarter of per a percent of New Zealand's land area, uh, which is absolutely abysmal. We, we, to, to leave them there would be to maroon them in the tiniest uh, remote parts of New Zealand and, uh, and ignore them further. Uh, I don't think anyone's trying to recreate the past by embracing predator Free New Zealand, if we wanted to recreate the past, we'd just be trying to build a time machine with National Science Challenge funding. What we're trying to do <laughs> is uh, alleviate a threat process, just as we're trying to wind the clock back by reducing CO2 emissions in the atmosphere to pre-1980 levels. We're also trying to reduce the threats of introduced rats, stoats, and possums to, uh, to levels where they don't threaten our uh, native fauna any longer. And, and I think that's a, a moral responsibility we have. We introduced these species to New Zealand, so we have the moral responsibility uh, for the damage they do. And, and importantly, it's not because these are invasive species, uh, introduced species, it doesn't even matter that they're invasive, it's that they're three, three species that are causing a disproportionate level of damage. In fact, they're causing extinctions of species in New Zealand. Uh, and. Uh, and and because it's only because they're introduced species that we have on the table the opportunity to remove them entirely from New Zealand. We have other native species which also cause damage, pukeko, uh, blackback gulls, harriers, and we control those in places where that has to be done, but we can't eradicate them because we have an environmental ethical duty to those species. So it's really just focusing on these species and, uh, and no one is trying to eradicate sheep from New Zealand as an introduced species, even though I do my best to, uh, to eat as many of them on Sunday roast night as I can. Um, but with regard seconds. to the final question of the possibility of it, I'm going to come in at, a, at an 8.5, and the reason I do that is because that's the uh, probability of rodent eradication success globally. It's 85%. And that represents, if we were 100% certain of it, if you're 100% certain of anything and don't embrace any risk, you never scale up, you never achieve anything greater. So it seems from rodent eradications that about an 85% success rate is our appetite for risk that allows us to push the boundaries. And so that's where I sit with uh, Predator Free New Zealand. And Wayne. Thank you. Uh, Predator-free 2050 is good politics, but it is scientifically flawed. I'm a 10 out of 10 for conservation, but I'm a 0 out of 10 on both counts for Predator-free 2050. To support Predator-free 2050, you have to be, in the uh, words or phrase of my good colleague here, a science denialist. That is, you have to pretend that 50 years of science and integrated landscape and pest management don't exist. First, New Zealand's and the world's leading experts in mammal eradication have concluded and already published that this is not possible. Second, success rests entirely on solutions with enormous technical and biological uncertainties and substantial social barriers to their use, in particular the genetic modification of wildlife. The chances of their successful application is next to zero. Third, even if you could release a gene drive or Trojan female, they will not eradicate predators because they work against biological evolution. The first example of them failing because of genetic resistance has already been published. Fortunately, there's a better alternative to Predator Free 2050. It's based on a better science and a better policy. First, we've proven that it's possible to protect our most vulnerable biodiversity in sanctuaries. Second, we know how to manage habitat around those sanctuaries, the halo, so that it supports greater numbers of our less vulnerable biodiversity. Third, we know how to manage those reserves as a connected national network of biodiversity. Lastly, we already know how to reverse the decline of biodiversity in New, Zeal New Zealand's indigenous biodiversity in the 67% of New Zealand currently unused for purpose, our rural and urban landscapes. These are possible, achievable, 
with current technologies and a modest increase in budget, but without the scientific, political and social risks of Predator Free 2050. Predator Free 2050 is a political distraction from what ecological science has taught us over the last half century. It's a distraction from solving the greater environmental problems that we face as a nation. Predator Free 2050 might be really exciting, but it's not rational. Thank you. Thank you, that's fantastic. And thanks to all the speakers for sticking to their two minutes. I'm impressed. Um, so now what I'm going to do is open it up to the audience for questions. And I might even put someone on the spot who I know will probably be jumping out of their skin to ask a question. So Bruce, why don't you go first? <laughs> Just to kick things off. I'm sort of wondering why people keep saying we're trying to turn the clock back. I went to an inspirational lecture by a Scotsman. Twice I heard him. He was doing similar things to what we're doing, but doing them in Scotland. And he said, you know, it's got nothing to do with turn the clock back. We're trying to restart the clock. So somebody tell me why they think that people working in projects around New Zealand are trying to set the clock back. OK, do we have a response on that? I can't remember who said that. Was that Jamie? OK, so just pass the microphone between you, and these ones are working as well. So. Yeah, I mean, I understand where you're coming from, and I understand what you're saying. Uh, I think if you look at the New Zealand biodiversity strategy, you'll see that goal three of the strategy is to maintain and protect uh, all of our native species, all subspecies, all their genes across their entire uh, natural range. Um, it's going to be impossible to do this unless you actually recreate or try to sustain uh, ecosystems as they are or, or, or turn them um, in, uh, in reverse, I should say. Um, so I understand where people are coming from when they say, we're not trying to recreate the past, we're just trying to prevent extinction. But I think that that is um, very unrealistic. I think if, if uh, ecosystems, landscapes, and species are going to be able to adapt and move into the, into the future, there has to be a capacity for evolution, and extinction is, is part of that as well. So I, I think we have to accept that extinction is part of the story. It's not the only story, and we can protect the vast uh, majority of our most um, cherished species. Uh, but for me, we're not going to be able to protect uh, all of them, and we also have a range of other responsibilities. Our responsibilities, for example, are not just to native species, they're also to our introduced species as well, and even those we currently consider to be pests. Remembering that uh, what we consider to be a pest changes over time. You know, colonial New Zealanders uh, thought very highly of introduced species and very lowly of native species. They spent their time removing native nature and introducing in great numbers, thousands of numbers, introduced species. They cleared forests, drains, wetlands, and so on and so forth. Our views have basically flip-flopped from that, from that point, and we tend to take a much uh, a similarly extreme view. I think there's, a, there's an extent to which we need to moderate our views, particularly in the conservation sector um, in general, to um, incorporate uh, the, the, the wide range of human values for, for biodiversity, including introduced biodiversity, and also the values that introduced species have uh, for their own lives as well, their intrinsic values, you could call them, uh, or, or however you want to frame it. Uh, so for me, some of the stories coming out of uh, the conservation sector are, are too simplistic, and they probably could do, to, do well to learn a little bit from a lot of the research that's coming out of social sciences, the humanities, the, and the perspectives of other people, of iwi uh, and our communities in general. So, yeah, I do, I do have some concerns. I do think that, um, going back to your original question, this one of um, pre-human nature and trying to uh, restore it to that, I think that is still very commonly the baseline. Um, Zealandia, it is the baseline. Zealandia is probably a bit extraordinary, to, to, to be honest, but uh, a pre-European uh, pre baseline is still very common. Um, so I don't think it's uh, terribly outrageous to suggest that that is actually frequently uh, the baseline that we use. Okay, we have another, oh, sorry, we haven't, okay, we're just, uh, we're going to have one short response and then we have another question over here. And then if you just stick up your hand while I'm um, looking around the room and I'll try and keep you in mind. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I think 
when people argue that people are trying to turn the clock back in this regards and for other things, it's, it's a reasonably contextless argument, to be honest. We're trying to reverse child poverty in New Zealand to levels um, before what we see today. We're trying to reverse economic inequality. We're trying to reverse CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. And uh, we're trying to reverse the threat of these predators to levels uh, not at what it's seen at today. So um, you might want to say that's uh, trying to, to turn back the clock. But uh, in, the, in the case of introduced species and invasive species, I don't think anyone's arguing that we should be removing sheep or cows from New Zealand uh, to, uh, that would destroy our economy. Nobody wants to go back to the past like that. It doesn't make any sense. So the, the argument as a whole just seems uh, a bit uh, irrelevant to me when people pose it that way. OK, Thomas. Uh, kia ora, everyone. Um, yeah, I don't think you quite answered the question properly, Jamie. But um, first of all, huge fan of what you say. Don't agree with you, but... I think you've got massive kahunas for what you do. Um, so my thing is... Um, yeah, it's quite hard to hear up here. It's not, I think it's to do You said with you had massive system. kahunas for what you do. It's the crux of it, yeah. Um, my thing is, yeah, we're not trying to recreate history. It's about restoring and moving forward. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, someone would argue if we're trying to recreate history, some people would be back on a boat to where they came from. So my one is, um, moving forward... What about all the people that want to get rid of these predators? And a core example is the Treaty of Waitangi says that Māori have a right over their Tonga species and stuff like that. So but I guess to you, Jamie and Wayne, what do you say when people want to eradicate these pests and there's a huge calling for it and an appetite for it? Predator-free 2050 requires a massive national consensus to work. <clears throat> we are a very diverse community, and this is a self-selected group of those people. To, ma to make it happen, you're going to have to actually force your neighbours to do things they may not want to do. It's really difficult for the government to get us to all pay our taxes on time and to abide the basic laws of the country without also demanding that we have, for example, a genetically modified organism in our backyard and schools. I don't understand how we can believe as conservationists that we might ride roughshod over the values of other people in our community. So the communities I deal with, and there's tens of thousands of people out there currently engaged in this, um, in this activity, they want to do what Paul Atkins referred to earlier, what um, Jan Hani has referred to, what Campbell referred to, what Andy Lowe referred to, which is they want to have nature in their place. And they know that to have nature in their place, they've got to take away the threats. And in New Zealand, for most of our nature that we want to look after to give it a chance to thrive, we've just got to take away the threats. We've got people who want to take action, who are taking action. This, this idea that it was a political, it's some political posturing, let's not forget, this, this idea didn't come about politically. They just jumped on the bandwagon because it rose in popularity. Um, this is an opportunity for all of New Zealand to partake in something that takes us to our next um, climbing of Everest, giving women the vote, you know, that cringy thing we love to do. We love to be the best in the business. We, we absolutely can do this, and if people want to, why would we stop them? So while we get the microphone, maybe I'll get the microphone down to Devon to pass comment, if I can, whilst I get to the next questioner. So thank you. Yeah, I guess I just don't understand this um, business about running roughshod. Uh, anybody who's run a, a restoration project anywhere in the, in the country knows that you're not going to get anywhere if you run roughshod. You have, to, uh, you have to get people to come on board. I've done it at the scale of the Abel Tasman National Park. We're busy doing it at the scale of uh, Egmont National Park at the moment. And you're never going to, uh, in, nobody's going to invest their money in a project where the prospect of it falling over because of social response to it in the next five years uh, is high. So it's all about building the communities of support, uh, listening to those communities, adjusting the program in terms of their concerns. And sure, there'll still be one or two folk out there who want to turn up for a photo opportunity to protest about 1080. Um, but they're not the people who are uh, standing in the way of these processes. And sitting alongside them are the 95% plus of people who are saying, 
I understand that you've got to use various tools that some of, some of them I don't agree with, but the prize is big enough for me and for New Zealand, uh, and I'm prepared to suspend my judgment on those matters. Okay, we've got a question here and then one down the back. Okay, my question effectively is, I guess we can say for the naysayers in this is, and I'm going to quote pre-Trump America, or somebody from pre-Trump America, um, as the starting point for my comment, really, which is JFK saying, we chose to go to the moon. He had no idea how they were going to get there, but it was an aspirational goal. It is a surely, isn't that what we're talking about here, an aspiration? It doesn't really matter, to my mind, that we do not get to completely free of every rat and mice by 2050. It's the fact that, from an aspirational point of view, isn't it something that the whole country can actually come together over to be aspirational? And that's, is that something that you can aspire to um, at that end, either end of the table there? The, um, the, that, that analogy of, of going to the moon is, comes up quite often. Uh, indeed, it was used by Sir Paul Callaghan in, in his motivating speech. I actually think a better analogy would be the, the fact that mankind has always looked to space and to go into it, and it's been a, a long pathway to get there, from the Wright brothers first learning to fly, to uh, sending the first spaceships into orbit, uh, to the International Space Station, to reaching the moon. So it's a pathway. So I don't see Predator Free New Zealand uh, or Predator Free New Zealand 2050 is neither we've got there or we haven't. It's going to be, a, it's not an either or option, it's a long pathway. And so I see a lot of the people that, uh, or, or the few people that dissent against the idea of Predator Free New Zealand, I find it hard to understand what they're actually arguing for, but they really just seem to be arguing for the status quo, that idea that our Taonga species are protected in less than a quarter of a percent of New Zealand, when what we're really talking about, I think, when I imagine predator-free New Zealand, is a pathway where we get more and larger islands predator-free. We've already learned today about uh, the, the Cape Sanctuary and uh, Project Manga, huger scales there. So perhaps we might not make predator-free New Zealand. Perhaps uh, Wayne's right and uh, the science won't come through. And, and as Kim King just said, we get 99% of the way. But I'd still be very happy to live in a New Zealand where we have 99% predator control over the landscape rather than a quarter of the percent. Thank you. Okay, so there's a question down the back here, and um... okay, okay uh, just two quick questions. I'll run them together for Jamie. Um, why do you characterise the um, introduction of a whole suite of mammals into a non-mammalian ecosystem uh, as as evolution, and do you understand the evolutionary process? Sorry, what, what was the question? I really can't hear with the echoing. Okay. Why do you characterise the introduction, the artificial introduction, of a suite of mammalian species into a non-mammalian ecosystem as an evolutionary process? And do you understand the evolutionary process? I think, I think one thing there's a misunderstanding there that people sometimes don't seem to understand, and that's that people are part of nature. And the, our process of introducing species was actually a, not, a natural process as well. It's not, it's not artificial. Uh, we didn't come down from outer space. I don't agree with Tom Cruise on that kind of stuff. That, you know, that, that, that was where we came from. I think if people really want to connect with nature, they need to understand that nature changes over time. And if, if you want to get people to connect with the nature in their backyard and nearby them, you have to be able to... Um, get them to appreciate that nature is diverse um, in its provenance. It's not just about native nature, it's also about the many introduced species that many people already uh, value very highly. Um, and getting people to connect on that level as well. Um, so uh, I think that too often in New Zealand we have this very brutal understanding of nature and of biodiversity and it's always winnowed down to uh, native species and the introduced species that are useful to us, those that are most important to our economy and that are most important to our, our sense of national identity. And, and that, that tends to cover off uh, basically all of the species that we value and that we manage for, um, whether it's uh, native or introduced species. It's generally those species that are most useful to us. That's why we spend so much money on birds, because they are such a big part of our uh, current sense of national identity, and because we make so much money out of them. 
Um, so we have to be a bit more honest with ourselves about why we do what we do. And when we reflect in those ways, sometimes it's not as um, pleasant, the realizations as some of us would like to have, that we're out there and we're these great heroes saving the universe and um, just making the world a better place. It, it actually does come back to, to values and a lot of the things that we do are, are for our own purposes, not for the purposes of the, of the species that we're, that we're protecting. Okay, okay. Nicola, uh, Nicola I, had I think a your, your well. answer is rather cavalier, but if you describe it as a natural process now, whereas before you described it as evolutionary, uh, but, you know, giving it that, that, that sort of... Sorry, I can't hear you. You're giving it that sort of legitimacy, trying to describe it as evolutionary, so you should be careful in your terms. Um, I'm a little bit grateful that um, Jamie talked about people connecting in their backyard because um, I want to pick up also on James's point about the long pathway. And recently um, I got to partake in a little bit of pest control in Pole Hill Valley with uh, I think a seven and an eight year old pair of girls. Um, now, those kids who are part of that incredible community, one of many throughout New Zealand, who've taken the mantle on to do predator control, to bring back wildlife. In the 100 metre stretch, which is about as far as I can walk, from the playground um, down through one of the tracks, we saw a flock of 12 kaka being chased by a falcon, Kiruru, Hihi and Teki particularly, both of which had been missing on the New Zealand mainland for 100 years. Now for those girls, their baseline has now shifted the opposite way we expect an ecology. For those girls, they will expect that their daughters and their sons will, will see he he and tiaki in an unprotected environment in the town belt area or the you know, Pole Hill Reserve of Wellington. That's our opportunity on the long pathways to shift the baselines and give, give us something to hang on to and grow. Question down in the audience here. So I just wanted to add um, one more thing on this idea of uh, human nature constructs, and that's in the field of animal ethics, we have a different responsibility to animals when we bring them into a human domain. So if a lion eats a gazelle on the prairie, that's a, a, a natural process and we wouldn't intervene in that. However, if a lion escapes in your zoo and breaks in and kills the gazelle, you do have a responsibility for that because those animals were in your human domain. So we have a differing level of responsibility for them. So similarly, that we brought those introduced species to New Zealand, and I've said this before many years ago, means we have a different ethical responsibility towards uh, our introduced species as we do to our native species. We've got one more comment from the panel here and then we'll go to our questioner down there. Just quickly, I, I guess I can hear it. Yep. I have trouble with the distinction that um, we're part of nature and that somehow the introduction of these species... Is it? Is it come up now? That the introduction of these species was somehow a, a wonderfully democratic process that everybody agreed with uh, and that now, because we're part of nature, we're not allowed to make a decision to remove the things that we made a mistake with the first time? There just seems to me a bit of a flaw in the argument there. I suppose I'd better respond to that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that um, it has to be that black and white. Um, I'm saying that you can uh, decide to manage for different purposes uh, in different areas, much as we currently do. Uh, I'm not saying that our existing parks and reserves network and the other conservation of initiatives that we're following uh, are perfect. There's a hell of a lot of room for, for improvement. But we have to understand that there's a whole lot of different values out there um, across the landscape. Um, and it's not just about uh, picking one or the other. It's much more complex than that. OK, question down here. Yeah, hi. I hope I'm going to pick up and build on that uh, in a slightly different direction. Um, over, there's been over 30 years of socio-ecological work done in Africa, Central Asia, uh, through, throughout Europe in terms of considering the rights and access and allowing local communities and, and national communities to express their values and, and to deliver conservation outcomes. So this is about perhaps... Uh, no, I haven't heard so much of that conversation here today apart, or yesterday apart from talking about engaging with Māori and, and enabling the treaty to be sort of expressed. But is there not another tool here that we haven't been talking about that needs looking at and is actually changing the paradigm for conservation on much of our land and allowing different access, different uses? And perhaps, you know, the question I'm going to have is, do you, what's your appetite for use of kaka, kiwi, keru, um, for commercial purposes as a means for delivering conservation gain? And uh, does that not speak to James' point? 
Does anyone on the panel want to respond to that? Um, this is a, a very active discussion um, within the science challenge at the moment. And uh, to my mind, um, if the ability to, uh, to eat kaka or other um, native species is an indicator of our success in restoring them to abundance in the habitats that they should be in, then why not? Um, I, think I'm, I think we're saying the same thing. I mean, um, the, the cultural practices associated with our indigenous species are, are very much up for discussion, and I think it's a really valid, a valid conversation to be having. Um, and, you know, we have a management plan for Titi uh, in, in the south, uh, where a, a level of harvest is, uh, is, is permitted and, and understood to, to be a valid um, relationship with that species. Um, why should it be different on others if they're in sufficient abundance? Okay, a question down here. Oh, sorry, James, do you want to comment? And then we'll go to the questioner down here. Yeah, look, Wayne might have something to add to this as well, but um, because of his experience in, in Africa. But uh, in New Zealand, we do already um, derive value from our, our resource, our conservation estate through tourism and such. And I, and I think what you're looking for is to take it to another level where we, we can put a, a dollar value onto the... The, the lives of those species, so perhaps people could pay to take a kedidu or a kaka, um, but then my experience from looking in, in Africa is that the price tag would be $100,000 for a bull elephant or, or $250,000 for another, another rarer species, so um, perhaps we could go down that road, but I'm not sure the price tag um, relative to the rarity of those species would really bring value for money. I think, I think we already see that with the mutton bird harvest on the, the, the Titi Islands off Rakiora and the efforts from um, Anati Wai and others to restore their seabird um, populations to levels where they can restart that harvest as well. Okay, Barry. Thanks, uh, Chia, and uh, great debate here, panel. Well done. And of course, a question to Jamie and Wayne in light of uh, the position that they're taking, and I want to fully understand. Uh, the uh, reasons behind. So I heard you say there's higher priorities, too expensive, we should focus on lands, uh, agriculture, sustainability. I'm not seeing it's an either or, I'm seeing it's a um, plus plus, we should be doing both. So a question to both Jamie and Wayne. So we're at a stage tomorrow where we've actually got the technology to eradicate possums, rats and stoats. And all we have to do is push the button. Would you push the button? Wayne, the microphone's down your end, so... No. I wouldn't push the button. Now, you might. I would want a whole lot more information uh, from the rest of my community, my diverse community, about whether that's what they want. I wouldn't assume. I want to talk a moment about absolutionism. All of what has been described here is all good stuff. What's at issue here is absolutionism. The fact that you package it as predator-free 2050 and absolute eradication, which not only is unachievable, but two people here have acknowledged that it's unachievable, but they just, 
they support it because it's jingoism. It's absolutionism and it's jingoism. I want our conservation to be meatier than that. I want it to engage with the complexity of ecological science and social science. I want it to engage with our communities at more than a jingoistic level. We're smart people. We don't have to engage in the sort of militaristic jingoism that we seem to be doing. We have a smart community. They know about integrated pest management. The farmers, the people managing their gardens and cities. <clears throat> I'm a little bit disappointed with how simplistic our conservation community engages with this problem. There's no room for absolutionism here. There's room for smart thinking and doing. And we're already doing most of it. You're doing a great job. Scale it up, coordinate with each other, throw out the slogans, and just get on with what you're already doing very well. Just do it better. And use the bonus that is new te incremental technologies. Just as that, a bonus. I've seen a lot of really exciting new ideas here today. And they will be incremental improvements on what we can do now. And they'll be excellent but we don't need the jingleism. Okay, while the microphone moves to Jamie, he was asked to respond, so, we'll, and then I'll get, there's a questioner down here somewhere who wants to, uh, some, wants to ask a question. And, and by the way, my question was on the assumption we've been through consultation, involvement, engagement with iwi, the community, so would you push the button, Jamie? Um, I, I really like what, what Wayne had to say on that. Um, yeah, again, I really support the, the idea that we, our, our conservation needs to be uh, based around the, the multiple different um, views in this space. And I mean, a couple of the people here uh, seem to epitomize that to me, that they're engaged in um, initiatives that are on a local level are very highly uh, valued by those local people and they've got really good engagement from them. Um, and that's fantastic. Um, it's, a, it's another thing altogether to, to, to take that and decide that it must be the case um, across the entire country. And as Wayne said, I'm really concerned with a lot of the militaristic uh, uh, terminology that's used in this space, um, because that seems to indicate that the government uh, or, or uh, enlightened uh, scientists or others will decide that uh, they know better than people and that they're going to try to push home uh, a particular value or a particular idea about how they believe that the environment should be. Uh, and that concerns me um, because I, I, I do think that um, conservation needs to be considered more on a case-by-case -case basis and on an area-by-area -by -area basis. Um, and again, it's one thing to get these great successes uh, in small areas um, and that are unique to specific communities uh, and another thing altogether to, to, to try to do it everywhere. Okay, a question down the back, and we are running out of time, so um, okay, just... Well, yeah, that previous question, was, I was going to ask a variation, and Wayne's already answered from his perspective, so I'll just ask Jamie. If the goal was changed to, to more of the intermediate um, point of improving pest control over large areas in a cost-effective manner, but not whole of New Zealand, would you be... Do you think current use of money is well spent in that direction? So if it was made less of a political, very ambitious vision, but the goal was to improve pest control to a much more cost-effective and large-scale um, system, do you think that's an effective use of current money? Sorry, I could not hear that. Um, okay, the question, the question was um, if you could achieve large-scale suppression rather than full eradication. Is this right? Oh, that is hard to hear up here. Would you push the button then? So same question as Barry, but you know we've gone bigger and better and cheaper. Where would you? Why, why wouldn't we? Yeah, honestly, I think all of this discussion is heading us just down the uh, down the wrong uh, direction for me. Um, it feels a bit like a witch hunt that we've got to you know we've got to find the the other beings in our in our society and our environment that we need to get rid of. And, and then we'll make this wonderful uh, new world of the future. Um, I think we need to be thinking about how we're going to work together, and I think we need to, uh, in terms of many of our introduced species, um, consider that uh, all of these species uh, have a role and a place um, in New Zealand now, even the, the ones that are considered um, invasive. 
um, and it's not, uh, for me, it's not really appropriate to consider just uh, taking those very um, overarching decisions and deciding that you're going to get rid of, uh, you know, many of these species at all, actually. Uh, I'm getting a bit frustrated because it feels like we're acting like we've got the benefit of time here, and we don't. This is about fighting extinction. This isn't about saying that it's okay to have some stoats over in them. Look, if we, if we had the opportunity uh, to push the button on stoats tomorrow and bring tiaki ba back, kākāpū back to the mainland, tākahe back to the paddocks, I'd totally push it. We don't have time and there's nowhere else in New Zealand where these things are. I, I also know, I feel like we've given a lot of air time to the controversial view, which is the nature of these debates, but I don't feel like we've done a service and a credit to the huge groundswell of people, scientists, philanthropists, industry, um, lawyers, philosophers, uh, philosophers, zoologists, communities who want this as a goal. And I would just really like us to focus on that and given the nature of my job, we don't have time. Okay, I'm gonna get Judy to make a comment on this while I get a microphone up here to one last question and then we'll call it a break. So Judy, if you have any comment on... Um... Mm, I found it very interesting because that was a very unexpected um, response from you two gentlemen and I'm kind of looking at them age-wise and I think about this whole sliding baseline where it's really difficult to show our young people what we've lost because in their lifetime if they get to still see one or two of these species they think that's all fine but we only need to talk to our grandparents to know what we've lost. So the sliding baseline I think really impacts on how well we can engage young people in, in this whole issue and that sense of of, of time that we're, that we're running out of. Um, I can, I, I've really listened with interest to what you two have had to say and there's, there's little bits that me says, yes, I agree with that. But at the same time, I keep coming back to um, the, the well-being that we as humans generate from our relationship to our environment. And for some of this, that's gotten deeper as we've gotten more involved in what the ecology of our, around our home is, and then on, on, for me on my island is. And I think that um, having seen the neighbours next to me say, oh, that looks good, I'd like to be in on that, and seeing that kind of growth happen, not from any pressure, but just because they get to enjoy the birds that we're, we're creating because we're giving them a better space to breed successfully. So I'd like to think that we're, we're not kind of starting from scratch, you know, and as Nicola said, we're building on a huge swell in New Zealand. There's thousands of us out there, minding traps, counting birds, looking under rocks for mollusks. We're a hugely engaged population, I think, and so I feel like that we, um, and we, and we have these amazing relationships now with Tangata Whenua, we're going forward together, and I really feel that we're not starting back at ground zero, we're actually well on the way with this thing. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to go to one final question up here, and then we'll call it a break for afternoon tea. Thank you. I guess I was interested in um, the concept of our ability to manage these endangered species and threatened species on smaller and smaller areas. Um, and I guess that really uh, would imply that New Zealanders um, have less and less access to that possibility. So how, how do we, what is the way we get the mandate to, um, to take that balance between depriving people who might want access to that in their backyards from those who might be enforced by having that, um, that set of values. How do we solve that dilemma? So send the microphone down this, this way, please. No, the other way, sorry. Thanks, Christine, I appreciate it. Um, I, I, I think the question needs to be reframed. We're actually not protecting biodiversity on smaller and smaller areas. We're actually protecting biodiversity on larger and larger areas. Aren't we? We're doing really well. Congratulations. You're making progress. Not only that, but we're also starting to protect these species in areas that are novel ecosystems. They're ecosystems that never existed before. 
and the dynamic ecosystems and the changing all the time and the hybrid ecosystems of natives and exotic species. And they're on our farms and our cities. And they're in the places we live, work and play. They're in the places where we can have a connection with nature. And my connection with nature is a connection with introduced as well as native species. And that's true for actually most of New Zealand. You're a self-selective group, I have to keep saying this. You're a, this is an echo chamber. The rest of New Zealand also seek value in introduced and invasive species. Iwi want to keep Kiori on some islands, and we respect that. Fishers want to keep trout and salmon in places where they can fish, and we respect that. We need to respect the diversity of values in New Zealand while we keep making progress in conservation for native species. And we're doing a great job. And you want to do it faster, I understand, and you're impatient, and you want it now. Well, you know, this is real life. This is what it takes. Good on you. OK, we'll get another comment from the panel, and then we might call it quits. So can you send the microphone down? OK, Jamie? Yeah, I, I James, was just going to say, I've been, I've been working in the social dimensions of wildlife management for over five years. And in a survey I, I undertook five years ago, I asked New Zealanders, do you think we should be doing eradication or control or doing nothing? And in fact, it was less than 1% of New Zealanders, New Zealanders nationally surveyed said doing nothing was an option. So we already have the groundswell of support and uh, the voices against the idea of predator control are an, an absolute minority, less than a single digit of a, of a percent. But importantly, we have to remember that we're talking about the invasive species, the few species that have disproportionately negative effects. We're not talking about trout, we're not talking about sheep, we're not talking about tomato plants, we're talking about rats and possums and stoats. And I'm yet to come across someone in New Zealand that thinks we should keep those species across New Zealand. Okay, one final comment down the end here from uh, Devin once it gets to him. <laughs> I guess, um, you know, there's a strong message about you've got to take the community with you. Um, every project I've worked on that's been in the forefront of our minds. Uh, I chair the Predator Free Wellington project at the moment. We recently ran a survey using the Wellington City Council's uh, reference group and a separate group, 1,500 people in total. 82% of them voted for eradication in Wellington City. Um, so, no, it wasn't 99%, as, as James is suggesting, but it was enormously high. Um, how much, what's the percentage at which you say you've got a going project? I might just leave it there, actually, because we are <laughs> over time. <laughs> I would... I would, like, I would like to thank all of the panel members. It was always my sort of vision, I suppose, to have a few different perspectives presented for the audience today, and I think we've certainly got that, so thank you.